All right, greetings, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord. Uh, welcome to uh, my humble abode here, uh, which uh, doubles as my uh, recording studio and uh, uh, Bears Gym uh, environment. Today I have my mascot with me. I don't know if you can see my little mascot. Boris, can you say hello, Boris? Hey, Boris. Well, he's, he's, anyway, he's over there. Okay. That's my little mascot. Uh, he's not interested in uh, saying anything today. So, I will. <laughs> okay, John 9 is where we're at today. We're in our New Testament uh, Bible study. Um, we have an interesting scenario here of a man who is blind from his birth. And frequently in this age and in that age, we say to ourselves, surely that man's parents sinned, uh, his forefathers, and that sometimes is the case. Uh, but in this case, uh, was not so. It just happens to be that he was born blind. Uh, so we move on here, uh, John chapter 9. And... Uh, Hopefully we will be here around about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, probably. Maybe less, depending on how quickly we move. Um, so here we go. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master... Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I don't know if you kind of caught that here, but uh, how could he sin if he just came out of the womb born blind? Uh, uh, sometimes the disciples kind of miss the point. And you know what? Sometimes I miss the point until it's after the fact. And then I look back and I think, Oh, that's what was happening. And that's kind of when I, my enlightenment happens. I look back when uh, I, I've either uh, been ripped off or uh, maybe po perhaps taken a wrong job move or, or uh, you know, a, a relationship that just was no good. You know, as far as uh, friends, there was just uh, uh, somehow the, the bent was always a way from Christ and, and to the world, and uh, eventually that uh, friendship has to uh, veer away from the man-to-man -to, -man to the man-to-God uh, relationship. Your number one relationship is to God Almighty through Jesus Christ. And uh, any other relationship that would affect that, you need to be very careful of that. And uh, if you feel yourself being brought down, that's the time when you start uh, easing out of the situation. All right. Um, so anyway, they're saying, you know, uh, did he sin while in the womb or did his parents sin? You know, it's kind of a ridiculous question. Um, but Jesus answers. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You know, what's really interesting is Jesus was the light of the world. He goes on uh, um, throughout the New Testament, peppered kind of through the uh, Gospels, is that he is the light. And now we are the lights because he is in us. And that little mustard seed that's in us represents him. And now we shed light in the world. And that's why worldly friends don't really want to hang around you that awful much. Because you represent Jesus Christ. Okay, So that's, that's normal. And same when your kids turn against you. That little seed of Jesus Christ that's in you represents Jesus Christ. And, and if they don't want to walk and follow Christ, they don't want to walk with you, okay? That's just part of the plan, okay? 
And uh, Jesus said, you know, the house will be divided, one against two, two against three. It's all about that little sword that's like a razor, and it cuts and it divides between the bone and the marrow. Truth and falsehood, okay? Uh, right and wrong, all right? Christ is a very, very sharp razor line, and you're either on one side or the other. Anyway, back to the text here. Um, Jesus is the light of the world. He is what represents light. And then we, as Christians, as born-again followers of Christ, try to represent the light by his spirit, by the power of his spirit, uh, his light uh, in the earth. We try to represent that. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his, his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. Now, you might think that's a little bit gross. And you know what? I think that's a little bit gross. You know, if a buddy of mine spit in the mud, in the dirt, and it made a little uh, squish, I would say, you know, you go put that on yourself. But you know what? If it's the Creator God spitting in the ground, and you're blind, and there's hope in your heart that he's going to make you well, you'll let him put it on you. If you're, uh, uh, I've never been blind. I hope I never become blind. And I, my heart goes out to those of you that are blind. That's a difficult, difficult uh, situation to be in. Um, you're pretty much at the mercy of others. And I personally hate that. You know, you have blindness. Uh, you have deaf, deafness. That's another kind of handicap. Um, you have paraplegics. You have those that are crippled. Uh, you have all varied numbers of ailments in this earth. And blind, blindness is very severe. You know, you're kind of at the mercy of others. All right. That's just a little Scooby mineral water here. You know, one of them Europeans, one with the bubbly uh, minerals in it. Uh, it's actually late night here in Wisconsin, USA. And uh, even for me, it's a little late to have coffee, so I'm having a little mineral uh, water today in the bear's den. It's very nice. Anyway, so not, not he doesn't just leave him there and, and not heal him and smear the mud on his eyes. He smears the mud on his eyes and then he says, go wash. And uh, he gets to the pool of Siloam. He washes and guess what? He comes out seeing. And so smear, having a little mud smeared on his eyes was worth it. Verse 8 of John 9. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? Yes, it was. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? Well, the creator of the universe put a mud salve on his eyes, told him to go wash. But what healed him was his supernatural powers in the back of the eye and the, and the brain connections and all that in there. God did that in a supernatural way. The mud and the water that for whatever reason that was the contact point God had for this man. And for all of us, you know, the different healings in our lives that we need to be healed of, delivered from, uh, we each have to take our own path. You know, if you've heard that song, I wish you well on your uh, trip to find yourself. Um, uh, basically, it's your path is going to be uh, slightly different at very hard levels of various things that will get you to realize how unimportant the things of this world is and how truly important everlasting life with Jesus Christ is. And that path will be specific for you because God has it for you. My path is different from your path and your path is different from my path. And that's the way God 
has it planned. It's all part of the plan, okay? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Boy, what a bunch of hypocrites, huh? It was uh, in our New Testament uh, interpretation. It was church day. Okay, it was a Sunday, and he healed on a Sunday. Well, isn't that the time to come and get healed? Isn't that the most wonderful time to get healed? The day of rest, you're off work. And uh, New Testament Christians, we meet on Sunday. If you want to meet on Saturday, go ahead and do that. Who cares? Meet and have fellowship with God, with other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And they judged him because he healed somebody on the Sabbath. How ridiculous. Verse 15 of John 9. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Um, I belong to a union, and if you go to a union meeting or a union gathering or whatever, you're going to have uh, many varied um, opinions out in the union, even though we are united in the same purpose of we are under the same contract uh, and working for a company. But there are varied levels of opinions in that union. And uh, here, these people, they have their opinions. And they see this, and they're kind of all over the place. They're all over the, the map, so to speak, of opinions. And, um, and that's okay. As long as you realize that God is the one that makes the final decision. He is the one that makes the opinion that sticks for eternity. So when you start saying, well, was this person born that way? Or was he born that way? Or because of his parents? Or because of his uh, grandpa? Or, you know, maybe because of his culture? Because of his race? Was he born, you know, in a geographical thing? And that, that's why he's like this. Every single man and woman on this earth must confess Jesus Christ for his or herself. He must and she must make a stand and confess him and walk with him. This man is putting in the situation of a divided company where he's going to have to make the choice, I vote for Jesus, I live for Jesus, I accept Jesus, I believe Jesus. And he's kind of being squished into this where he just can't be wishy-washy on the subject because he used to be blind, and now he can see. So he knows something the other people don't. A man who has more power than any of these other people has just touched him and healed him. Okay, we move on to the text. Lest I get on a soapbox and really go down that road, uh, we'll get back to the text. <laughs> They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Of course, you bet you he's a prophet. He's the Son of God. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son? Who ye say was born blind, how then doth he now see? 
I was raised in a Pentecostal environment where there was many, many services of um, uh, people that would, uh, you know, have this, you know, miraculous healing and they're touched and they're, they're bouncing around and you know what, and you see them a week or two later and there's no difference in their life. Okay, it was all a show. Some are real, um, but you always have those that want to be part of the party and uh, get involved. You know, they don't want to be left out. They want to be part of the parade. You know, it's their turn to, it's their turn to drive the truck too. You know, they they want to they want to be in the seat. Uh, but in this situation, there was a reality. And um, but the parents, they now are going to have to make the decision to go out on a limb because they could find themselves being without a job, being without a home, being without food, uh, being banished from their uh, group back in those days was a serious, serious business. Okay. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. Yes, they did fear the Jews. Many people fear the world. They fear not being accepted by their friends, by their political party, by their union brothers and sisters, because they stand up for what they believe in. But the time will come, friend where you'll have to choose between the acceptance of God Almighty and the world. You can't serve both. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. They don't want to go too far out on a limb. You know, in this day and age, they don't want to call sin, sin. You know, they want to say he is, uh, he is happy, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, gay, uh, he is, uh, uh, he is uh, ADHD, you know. These are people that are out of control. There are, there are some that, uh, as far as the emotional and the chemical imbalances, there are some, but we, we're, they're not out of control. Um, as our society would seem to say. Uh, they're very quick to medicate our children, uh, but eventually the medicine wears off and they're back to normal, and they need more medicine. And uh, so you see they're in this constant loop of medicine. Um, once again, it doesn't matter what our society says, it matters what God says. What does God say about the homosexual lifestyle? What does God say about it? What does God say? What did God do with Sodom and Gomorrah? What was his uh, outlook of all that? Okay, um, obviously God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, uh, uh, saying that you are a gay pastor or a gay uh, Christian, that's an oxymoron that cannot happen. That's like saying you are a, a drunk pastor or you are an adulterer pastor or a murderer pastor. It's an oxymoron. It cannot happen. Okay, so the parents don't want to go out on a limb. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. See, they've pegged him already. Jesus said it wasn't because of him or his parents, but they're pegging him. Yeah, he's, he's a sinner. They want to call Jesus the sinner? He was without sin. Isn't that interesting? Jesus was without sin. These are the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the hypocrites. They had the situation of the woman they caught in adultery. He said, those of you without sin cast a first stone. It's the same bunch of people. Guess what? Nobody casted a stone. They all left because they all had sin but they want to accuse him of sin. He was clean, pure. That's our Jesus. Okay, the blind man now 
peeps up. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not that. However, one thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, but now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How open he thine eyes? So they want to ask, they want to re ask the question. He answered them, I've told you already. I already told you. He healed me. Why do you want to retalk about it? Rehash it. Okay? He healed me. I told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Now the ex-blind man pops up and says, The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. He healed me. You guys couldn't. Basically is what he's saying. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. So once again, they got their accusations. The blind man was blind because he was a sinner. Jesus was a sinner, and they were righteous, even though they were evil. They called the creator of the universe a sinner, and a man that was just healed of being blind a sinner, and yet they are the ones with sin. That is the epitome of hypocrisy. The epitome of the blasphemy of the spirit. To accuse the Messiah of being a sinner. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now he's really going to have to step up. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. When we hear this, our response should be the same. This man's Response, we're about to read um, what he says. Unfortunately, it took me a few years till I was about 15 years old for me to respond to that. And I had many ups and downs um, from that time to now. And, uh, but it took me a few years until I knew it was time. I just knew it was time. Like I said, I had my road. You're going to have your road. This blind man had his road. And I was sitting at a Christian concert as a non-believer, even born in, in, into a, a Christian, uh, a mixed Christian home, um, and raised in a uh, somewhat Pentecostal type environment and having the church services you know, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, really, it was out of that environment in, in a gymnasium hearing... Uh, a Christian uh, rock band uh, performing and, and sharing the message of Christ is when God came down and touched me. And I responded. And my life was never the same. I wasn't always happy, definitely. Actually, more, you know, more affliction comes to your life when you realize the truth because you realize you've got to change more things in, life that you, in your life that you thought you had to. But it's for the better. 
And as you get older, there seems to be like more afflictions, more troubles, but with them more affliction, more troubles, comes more joy, comes more peace, comes more understanding of eternal principles and truths and peace with God. That, and then the, the older you get, it seems like the more pressure is squeezed on you and the more you can take it easier because you know who's in charge, okay? You know who's in charge of the plan and that's him. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. That's what we were created for, friend, to worship Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world that they would see might not see. And those that don't see would see. Kind of an interesting flip-flop there. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? It's kind of an interesting thing. If the pretenders... God kind of says here that you see, but you're going to be made blind. And those that are blind are going to be made to see. And as for myself, one day I was blind, but now I see. And he's basically telling them that. Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. God hates Falsehood. He hates it. God hates falsehood. That's why he said the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into heaven before you because when they reach the depth of their depravity, they realize their sin and they reached out to Jesus Christ and they became his disciples. They stopped the sinning. They stopped being tax collectors and prostitutes. But when they were in their deep depravity, they said, yes, we are sinners. Yes, we are. We're dirty, stinking, lousy sinner. When you realize that in your life, it is the best place you can pee because you've realized the truth. When you say that, then you can reach out to Jesus and say, yes, I need forgiveness and I need you, Jesus. When you do that, you'll be the happiest person that you can be while walking on this earth. When you're honest, when you're honest with God, things happen in his way. Things happen in his timing and we can then pray according to his will. And so with that, friends, I think we did very well. I think we are in our time frame that I was hoping for. And um, next time we meet in the book of John, we'll be in uh, chapter 10. And we did pretty well in John chapter 9 today. With that, God bless you. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, peace be with you. We'll see you, friends. <laughs>